Well, thank you, uh, John. There's not one word left unsaid, I think we'd all find. But does anybody see any parallels between fast track MOUs in the last little while? Does anybody see any parallels there with what we're being told or not being told? Has anyone seen any parallels about how we're being treated and being mistreated? I actually think that what John is saying is what we're facing. And he did say that the, the eyes of the world are upon us. We're either going to win this for ourselves or we're just going to turn a blind eye. But I know of no other place in Australia where you can farm like you can farm here. And that would apply to many other parts of Australia. You can't go anywhere else. There is no other place to go. It's a very big country, but we have what we have here, and that's it. So unless you have another destination in mind, we're pretty much staying here, I think. And I, and I seriously, uh, on your behalf, I guess, thank John for those wonderful words. I just wanted to now just give you a little bit of a flavour and a bit of a feel for where we're going next. With all of that, I, I, I think it's probably good that we can just just chill a little bit. We now have a little bit of a, another musical interlude from uh, from, from Paul. And then I want to ask us to think about some questions. Now there's well over 500 people here, interestingly. I don't know if this is one of the bigger public gatherings in, in Narrabri, but probably one of them. But there are 500 people have 500 different opinions. I don't actually want to hear your opinion, I want your questions. Opinions are not what we need today, we need questions. We need to inform each other and to inform ourselves. So don't take our word for it. Make up your own mind. We're going to have a little bit of music. And then I'm going to get a panel. There'll be, uh, there'll be Ron. Sorry. Yes, yes, yep. We've got one more speaker, don't forget. So there'll be, in our presentation panel, there's going to be Ron, uh, sorry, John and, um, and Jeff. Right. Now, I want to introduce our, our next speaker. Sorry about that. <laughs> Rob McCreese. Okay, so we're, we're, we're talking now about Australia. Okay, now this you'd say, oh, that stuff, that's all over in Wyoming, you know, those guys, they just get it tough, you know. Well, okay, let's hear from Rob McCreese, who's a Queensland farmer and a mining and community person from the Felton Valley and he's been working on some of these battles on their behalf. So, over to you. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, don't go away, don't go to the pub. Um, I've been asked to tell you about what's happening in Queensland. Um, I met a guy down the pub before who said um, for all he cared Queensland could be sold off to Papua New Guinea, um, just as long as the state of origin match is carried on. But I'm sure he's an exception. Um, I'm just hoping desperately that these slides are going to come. Ah, Eureka. Sarah, do you mind just giving me a wee help? How do I get to his slideshow? I just want to go to the slideshow. Okay, so I'm just all and a few tours. There it is. Uh, just a little bit of background. Sometimes when um, these big projects come along, it's easy to get sort of consumed by the little, well, it's not little around here, but the local issue. You, but you always have to think about all the big things that are going on. You know, the food security challenges, the world's population is growing so fast, so many more people to feed. Um, land availability is falling due to the spread of the cities. We're losing land to mining, we're losing land to degradation around the world. We're draining our irrigation aquifers. Peak oil and peak fertilizer, and we've got climate change. And 97% um, of climate scientists say the world's warming and humans are causing it. So that's good enough for me and I'm quite worried about it. 
we've got to leave 80% of our known reserves of fossil fuels in the ground if we're going to have a decent chance of keeping global warming to 2 degrees, which is considered safe. We've had 1 degree so far, and I don't know about you, but things are getting pretty hot where I live. We just had a very hot summer. Last year was the hottest before. And it's interesting that when you talk about coal seam gas, a lot of the coal seam gas companies claim that coal seam gas is a clean fuel, <coughs> low emissions. And, and it's true that um, if you've got gas in a bottle, the emissions you get from burning it are roughly half of burning coal. But the big issue is, what are the emissions in getting the gas into that bottle? What are the fugitive emissions? Only methane is such a strong greenhouse gas that only 3% of it has to leak on the way to that bottle, and it's no better than coal. And there's a lot of results coming from America, a lot of scientific work going on, showing that uh, gas isn't clean, it might not be any better than coal, could be even worse. So what's our um, government going to do? They're not going to do this, which would be the obvious thing to do. Because we all know renewable energy coexists happily with farming. It protects the water supplies, it's happening all around the world. Um, bottom left there is a concentrated solar thermal plant in Spain concentrating the sun's rays on salt to use through the night so you can have base load from solar with those uh, wind turbines in Germany. Lots of farmers in Germany are making a lot of money because they've got renewable energy on their land and it's not stuffing up their water, it's not affecting their health. It's the obvious thing for us to do here. But no. Um, this is our, this is my local MP. Um, Ian McFarlane, just after he was sworn in as uh, industry minister, promised to get every molecule of gas out of the ground. This is from someone who, who accepts the climate science, who's worried about global warming. So this is what's going on in Queensland. Um, you may have heard of three big export projects already approved. So the original ones were Origin, uh, QGC and Santos, and each one has sold off chunks. There's one pending, the Arrow one. Now, Shell said it's not going to go ahead with that, but the implications are they'd love to drill those wells and sell the gas to, to other people because companies like Santos are desperately short of gas for their projects. I think there's around 7,000 wells in Queensland now that are drilling all the time, and they're predicted to be 40,000 soon. And one lesson we can learn from the United States is that when you've got some wells, you're always going to get more because they drill the best bits first, they sell the gas on contracts and then they're desperate to get more gas to supply those contracts. So some people have referred to it as a bit of a Ponzi scheme. They have to keep drilling more and more and more. So this is just the basics of getting coal seam gas out of the ground. The, the gas is trapped in the coal seam by water. So the, the way they get the gas out is to, to pump the water out. They, they drain the water out of the coal seams. The gas companies call it dewatering. Enormous amounts of this water is coming out, and it's got a lot of salt and other toxins in it, and it's a major issue. Uh, in Queensland, the, the Queensland government has told the companies that um, they're not allowed to have evaporation ponds, which was the original uh, method. So they don't have evaporation ponds anymore, but there's a lot of holding ponds. Um, <laughs> and so, so they're making them do reverse osmosis, which is a filtration business. and. Um, that's all very well, and you have some water you can use for some things like irrigation for some time. But one big problem is the amount of salt that um, comes out of this stuff. This is from the National Water Commission. So the, the three projects, the three big export projects that are so far approved, will produce enough salt to fill the Mel Melbourne cricket ground to the brim 15 times. They haven't the faintest idea what to do with it. They talk about beneficial reuse. And if you ask one of these gas company people, you know, can you give me an example of beneficial reuse of this salt? The only thing I've heard them say is swimming pool salt. Well, you need a heck of a lot of swimming pools to use all that salt. They've, they've looked into piping it to the ocean, 500 kilometers. They've looked into trucking it to the ocean. But the end result is going to be, it's going to get buried in the ground. That's what's going to happen. They're going to bury it on site. And it's going to be a toxic legacy of this industry for a long time. You know, the Darling Downs is, is, is famous for it. Food production, everyone around the world knows about what a rich farming area it is. But, but these guys don't call it the Garden of Darling Downs, they call it the Serac Basin. You know, they rename areas. Because if everyone, if people knew that they were going to be doing this to the Darling Downs, they'd say, oh, you can't do that. But if you call it Serac Basin, it's not a familiar name. So I, I'm quite sure they probably, have they got a new name for the Liverpool Plains? 
Bugger? Bugger Basin? <laughs> yeah, they call it the Gunnedah Basin or something like that? Yeah, it's all part of the plan. This is a Halliburton fracking truck. Halliburton did a deal in America to get exemption from the um, American Clean Water Act. Um, the, you, you go to Roma, they've got a massive base in Roma, they're driving around over the place, fracking away merrily. They, they say, they estimate roughly 40% of the Queensland wells will be fracked at least once. Sometimes they go back again. So this is the, the basic sort of problem. They want to drill down through the Great Artesian Basin to get down to gas either underneath it or above it. And uh, they say, trust us, we know what we're doing. This is the, the Santos um, export plant on Curtis Island at Glaston. Uh, Curtis Island is the biggest um, island in the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. And um, this is just one plant. The other two plants look exactly the same. They're on the big line. And uh, this is important for you guys down here because as soon as these plants start exporting gas, um, the price of gas is going to double at least or maybe triple because the world price is so much higher than a domestic price. And, and these plants are going to act like a massive big vacuum cleaner. They're going to be sucking all available gas up there. So um, Sandals might talk about you know, energy, energy security in New South Wales and supplying um, manufacturers in New South Wales. But the only way that manufacturers in New South Wales are going to get gas is if they're prepared to pay the export price. And that's going to be hard for them. That's looking from the plant back across Glaston Harbour. You probably heard of dredge the harbour to um, allow these big uh, gas tankers to come in. They've killed off the fishing industry, poisoned a lot of fish and a lot of fishermen. It's all go, go, go. So this is um, on the west of Darling Downs near Miles, and it really is an invasion. Uh, it's really, it's the second invasion this country's had in a couple hundred years, um, and now we know what it feels like. Um, I don't know how many of these trucks I've seen going through to Wimba. None of these pipes are made in Australia. We don't have steel mills that are capable of making these pipes. So um, one of the companies was getting the pipes made in Japan, and they were shipping them to Malaysia to get painted, and then, and then shipping them to Australia to go in the ground. So this is one of the main lines, 500 kilometers from the west of Downs all the way up to Gladstone. There's three projects, three pipelines. And then you've got all the interconnecting lines as well. Now this is the Tara district. Um, you can see the, um, the network of coal and gas wells there. And the, the blue dots are, are registered water bores that farmers and domestic users use. And, and those are the gas wells, those little orange triangles. They're in place right now, you can go and have a look. That's the, um, on the right hand side, that's the water processing plant, they call the Kenya plant. And it's got a pipeline to put treated water into the Chinchilla Weir, which is the Chinchilla Town's uh, drinking water supply. That's on the Condamine River. Uh, this is the Condamine River. Anyone know who that is on the surfboard? That's Ash Grunwald, the musician. In fact, he's coming to the Pilliga, I see the poster there. He very bravely put on a gas mask and jumped on that surfboard. You can see all the bubbles. The gas is coming up through the bed of the river. And um, the local mayor is very quick to say, oh, it's just natural, it's happened before. But all the local farmers say they've never seen this before. And not only is it coming out of the, through the river, it's coming out through the ground as well. It's only visible because it's water. So there's a lot of people there have got their own little gas detectors, and you can hold, it to, hold the thing to a crack in the ground, and the things are going off. So there's gas coming everywhere. Because as soon as you release that gas in the coal seam, it's going to find the easiest way to the surface. And the easiest way might be up the pipe that the gas companies put there. But there might be a crack in the rock or through the soil, and it'll just follow the easiest way to the surface. So there's a health crisis on the Tower Estate. Estates. There's 3,000 people live on blocks of land there, and they happen to be living on a gas bubble. They've got terrible health impacts and nosebleeds, headaches, kids with rashes. The Queensland government had a big inquiry and said everything was fine. But um, it looks like it was stitched up. Erin Brockovich is helping now. I hope she can help. And this is a bit bigger scale. The chinchillas over there on the, um, the right-hand side, miles up the top, condom and down the bottom. 
So it's about 30 k's vertically from Miles to uh, Condamine. The blue dots again are the registered farmers' bores, and, and those are the gas wells that are in place now. And if you drive along those roads, you can see that the like sort of sandwich bores along every road end for all the different drill rigs, often there's half a dozen, you know, this energy company or that energy company. They're also building massive compressor stations to pump that gas up to Gladstone. It'd be well worth your while just taking a short drive up there and seeing what's going on. It's industrialization of the Darwin Downs. But not to worry, we've got these guys looking after us. We've got something called the Gas Fields Commission. And they're there to promote coexistence. That's what our government's giving us, coexistence. It's not about whether things should go ahead or not. It's happening, and they're to make it happen. So we've got a collection of industry people, business people, mayors, retired Ag Force presidents, the chairman. It's really awful. A token scientist. This one, because they got the money in the pocket, man. Yeah, this one. Uh, this sums up coexistence. Go to wool. Piss the farmers off, rip it out, stuff everything, make a few miserable dollars, then what? Ian Wan made that himself, it sums things up pretty well. And a few familiar faces here probably. Former politicians, all working for industry and lobbying. It's really awful, isn't it? People that we've trusted in the past, and now look. So, a um, little bit about our, our campaign at Felton. Um, that's the district. Um, this company came along, they wanted to have an open cut coal mine and a petrochemical plant. It was just going to be horrid. Which was lucky, because we had something to fight. So we did a lot of this sort of stuff. We occupied the Premier's office, that was a good stunt. <laughs> we did a lot of fundraising. We raised money at race days. We always tried to get pretty girls in the front of pictures. And then we did this, we, we commissioned, with some of the money we'd raised, we employed a renewable energy consultant to look at the potential for renewable energy at Felton. And we found that we could produce enough energy just in our little valley for 160,000 homes. So we went to government and said, well, we don't want your stinking coal mine, but we're quite happy to have wind turbines and solar panels. And um, it just makes so much sense, you know, why don't they do it? We'd still like to do it. And then Drew Hutton came along halfway through and he told us he just started Lock the Gate. He told us about Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King and the civil rights movements and civil disobedience. So we thought that sounded pretty good. So the next day we, we announced a campaign of civil disobedience. We didn't really know what it meant, but it got a lot of attention. <laughs> I was live on Radio National Breakfast with Fran Kelly. I had to try and make stuff up. We did funny stunts like this. We, we took wheelbarrows full of vegetables into the middle of Toowoomba and, and blockaded the main junctions. That got a lot of attention. We, we uh, had protests both at government and opposition meetings. Went to local shows. We didn't have pretty girls, we put kids in the front. Uh, we dressed up in animal costumes. Uh, we studied our enemy. They're a really handsome bunch we were up against. Um, we always stayed where you're politicians, but you know about that. Uh, that's my wife in a platypus sit down at Parliament. The policeman's just got the call to, he to tell him that there's someone up on the roof. So that was good. We had some guys from Brisbane that jumped up on the roof and did that. They were from Six Degrees. That's our local, uh, our, our local Picasso. That's Frank Mingle. We applaud secret weapons. We gate crashed the party the company had and we doubled the people at our party that they had at theirs. That office is shut down now, they've gone. Then they tried, they tried to, um, the way we finally won was that we managed to get a promise out of the, the LNP that if they were elected they wouldn't allow mining there. And after they were elected the company sent us all a letter wanting to talk to us to, you know, a load of waffles. So we thought, right, we'll have a ceremonial letter burning outside their office. And I learned later that Gandhi did this sort of stuff, and it's a pretty effective thing. You know, if you get a letter from a mining company, you go to in front of their office and burn it in front of them. It, it, it sends a certain message. I think it should be more of it. <laughs> so then we organized a food festival. There was my wife Sally's idea. 
we didn't know if anyone would come. Costa came, it's our special guest, and Alison was glad to share. And a couple of thousand people came, we just couldn't believe it. Celebrating local food production, we didn't mention mining at all, it was just about connecting city people with, with local food production. And then we got this letter from the Premier. And say anything that you like about him, and I say lots about him, but he tends to stick to his words, so we're pretty happy with the promise he made. So then we had another food fest. So we had 5,000 people last year. It's on again this year, and there's going to be more. That's Salad with Costa. Uh, if you want to learn about French Felt campaign, there's information there. And the food fest was on the 27th of April, and we'd love to see you there. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for our